It's an honor to be on this stage and to be able to talk to you this morning. We're just going to plug some things together and get some technology revved up here. Yeah, so um, let's start with a question. Has anybody here been to Japan? Show of hands. Wow, actually, this is a, this is a pretty cosmopolite group. Um, so if you haven't been to Japan, uh, put it on your list. It's a fascinating country, beautiful place, um, some incredible cities, uh, and just the most, uh, the most interesting cultural experience. Um, the people are, they have this unique social construct about them, and the way they take care of you as a visitor, uh, it's, just a, it's just a wonderful place to go. And the food, oh my gosh, incredible. Um, maybe the best in the world. I had the chance to go to Japan to spend some time working with an insurance carrier quite a few years ago, and I was able to go uh, a number of times. In fact, it wasn't until the second year of my travels over there that I realized that I had missed something very basic about the way they do things in Japan. Now, they do a lot of things different in Japan, but this, this uh, I, I felt kind of dumb after I realized this. The thing that's interesting about Japan's cities is that their streets have no names. I wanted the U2 song for my lead-in, but they didn't give me that. Um, so let me show you what I mean. So here's a hypothetical city grid for a normal, let's say, American city, or frankly, anywhere else in the world, pretty much, except Japan. So we've got a grid of streets, and of course there's some blocks, and each street has a name, and you know how this works. So a given building or a location on one of those streets, well, we would say that's at 44 East Erie Street or whatever. Um, in Japan, they don't do it that way. Their blocks, their grids look like this. The streets don't have any names, and instead, in every little area, they give the blocks names. Actually, they give them numbers, but in some of our cities, we give our streets numbers too, so it's kind of the same, but, but backwards. And then within those blocks, well, every building on each block also gets a number. And so those numbers are uh, produced in chronological order of construction. So the first building built on block five gets the number one, and so on. And so when you write an address of a location in a city in Japan, it looks like this. And I'll break this down for you. We'll walk through how this works. 251 Yae Yaesu Chuoku Tokyo. For those of you who speak Japanese, I'm sure I'm butchering it, but I'm trying. Um, actually, this is the Americanized way. They actually write it backwards. They go from most general location to most specific. So let's do that. Here's Japan. Tokyo is one of 43 precincts in Japan, kind of like states. We think of it as the city, but it's really just the metropolis that fills that precinct that we all know as Tokyo. And then inside Tokyo, there are quite a few cities, um, maybe a little bit like boroughs in New York or something like that. And so Chuo City is our city. You can see it there. And then Yaesu is like a like a ward within the city, a smaller subgrouping. So we're zooming in here, and there's the, the famous Marunouchi train station right in the heart of Tokyo. And then within Yaesu, we have this 251 number, uh, and that's the fun part. So I'll break that apart. Um, the two actually is like a subset of that ward. Maybe, maybe it would be a precinct, an even smaller grouping and each of those has to be small enough that you can number the blocks within them. And so if we go to Tukome, we see here inside of it that there are, um, there are a series of blocks, and it might be a little hard to see on the screen from the back, but there's block five inside this precinct. And then of course within that block, well, there is building number one. And it turns out that uh, Tokyo Chouku Yae, so Tukome 5-1, is this bookstore. And so now you know how to find your way around Japan. 
I didn't realize it worked this way and thought naively that the streets had names and they used numbers and I kind of stumbled my way around and actually the people were very nice and the transit is incredible. Did I recommend that you go to, to Japan? You should do that. But it took me years to figure out that actually they do everything the other way. And this is an example of a reciprocal relationship between two different things. Uh, sometimes we call that du a duality. It's really common in mathematics, but we see it in other places as well. And it reminded me of something that I wanted to come and talk to you about today. Something we've been working on at Surify, and something that I think has a little bit of a connection with this discovery that it took me so, so many years to figure out. And I, I will admit that I was probably um, a victim of my own assumptions about how the world worked. And I learned a little bit. Um, after enough time and having it stuck in front of my face. So there's, uh, there's Japanese addressing scheme for you. Now let's talk about core systems. Uh, so I need to start with another question. Actually, I'm gonna make an assertion first or an observation. I think this has actually been well treated already this morning by both our wonderful panel and Dustin's uh, prologue. But, um, but if you ask, you guys, insurance carriers, life insurance and annuity carriers, what's on your mind? What are you working on? What's the priority? Or even if you go find professional askers like analyst firms and they go ask you all, the resounding answer right now is that digital enablement is the number one priority at the average life and annuity carrier. Now it might be your number two or you might be one of the rare few that's just knocked this out of the park. But by and large, most of us are working very hard and grappling with this challenge and this opportunity. And so digital enablement, I mean, this is not some new idea and we've, I could, I could have put this slide up you know, for years were it not for COVID. We've all been struggling with this. And so the question really is, why, why are we still, why is this still here? Why is this so hard? Why is this such a tough problem? And at Surify, that's pretty much what we do. We work with, some, with quite a few of you actually on various forms of digital engagement and digital delivery, and it's hard for us too. So to explain what, 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 what we realized and what we think is making this so difficult and why we are bringing something new to bear on the problem right now, um, I need to back up for a second. Um, so let's talk about these systems for a minute. I said a new core system. Let's talk about the existing core systems first. You all know what these are, right? These are your policy administration, your claims, your billing, financials, could be underwriting. Um, things like document storage or management. Maybe you have an engine that holds um, uh, assets and branding material. All kinds of things where you keep track of information. These systems, largely built a long time ago, um, were built to enable us to transition from doing record keeping on paper to doing it in the computer. Um, and there are a lot, an awful lot of carrier systems of record, I've abbreviated it there, running on computers with software written uh, in languages that existed before quite a few of you were even born, um, which I think is, is, is interesting. We could also do, uh, we could also argue that these systems have very high inertia even if they are at very low velocity right now, uh, it's very hard to make them move or go or, or go anywhere. And yet, we love them, right? Yeah? No? Maybe? Thumbs up? We love them in a special way, at least, because our businesses depend on them. We can't run our, we cannot, the, the carrier can't run without those systems, and they really have stood the test of time. And there are an awful lot of great people in this building this week working on building the next versions of these systems. And so that's well and good and not something we do at Surify. But I will just note that if we were to do, have you ever been to one of those weddings where, um, where everyone stands up and then they call in kind of reverse order how long you've been married and then people start sitting down and at the end it's like, you know, your great grandma and, and they're the last one standing. And we could do that with number of core systems or policy admin systems. I bet we could play that game and we could all stand up. And I bet some of you have uh, more than two or three or four of those. Uh, you might have quite a few. Anyway, there are a lot of those systems of record and they are running your business. And if I can just uh, pick at them just a little bit, when we think about digital, 
there are some challenges that a lot of those systems impose. Um, one of them is that adding new interfaces to them, if they can't already expose information and process, can be very difficult and expensive. Sometimes in money, sometimes in time. Sometimes it can be impossible if you don't have the source code and you don't have anybody who can work on it. Um, and so extending them is difficult. Um, they also, uh, they, they tend to have latency. And by that I mean technical latency. We ask them a question over one of those interfaces and it might take them a while to come back with an answer. And latency is very, uh, is, is, uh, is a challenge in a digital world where users are not used to that. And so can they answer questions quick enough is one thing. Um, a lot of these systems need, uh, need a rest, kind of like me. Uh, I'm getting old and I like to take naps and so do they and that's okay. It's very reasonable for them to go into a quiescent period at night to reconcile or maybe down for maintenance and updates on a regular basis. But out in the digital world, um, it's pretty rare for Amazon.com to go down and people have different expectations. And so these systems have an uptime challenge sometimes. And then one other thing I'll point out is elasticity. Um, demand dynamic is very different for core systems than it is for digital, right? In, in the digital world, we could have a quiet period and then you could put the right commercial on the Super Bowl and suddenly we have two or two and a half orders of magnitude more load on our front end than we did a moment ago. Um, and that is not something generally that these record keeping systems were engineered to solve. And so overall, I would say, generally speaking, when we look at digital enablement, these red systems were not engineered to solve that problem. And that's okay. That's not their fault, nor is it the people who built them's fault. But they work on a different part of the problem. And so I would argue that, uh, that we, need to, we need to recognize that as we look at how we're gonna solve this problem going forward. Um, I talked about the wedding game already. You've got a lot of these systems in place. And so if you'll humor my picture, we're over here trying to make these purple things, these digital experiences that you can put out on the edge and give to your customers and to your users and to those humans who are not part of your organization but who may want to interact out on the internet. And so the question now is, how do we connect these things together? And I would just say that probably the reason we're still all struggling with it is because there is this gaping divide between the expectations of those humans who have, been, who have learned how systems on the internet behave when they go to Amazon or Google or whatever and get answers at scale really fast any time of the day or night on any device. That's what people expect, right? In retail grade digital experience. And then over here on the other side, we have these red systems of record which were built primarily in another day and age to solve a very different problem which they solve pretty well by the way. And so that is a huge gap between expectation of those future users and the systems we have in place to solve home office problems. And I think fundamentally that's the challenge and getting these two things to somehow come together is where the rub is in this problem. And so I'm excited to introduce to you our solution for this problem. We have been hard at work on it for the last a little over a year now and we are coming to market this week announcing publicly that we are building a platform called Surefy Core Connect. And Core Connect is built expressly to solve this problem, to sit in between one or more digital experiences, including the ones that we make at Surefy, and your systems of record. So what is Core Connect? It's a digital experience engine for you. It's a vertically focused, purpose-built, headless technology running in Surefy's cloud that's designed to bridge that massive gap. And as a CTO at Surefy, I would love to get into all the technical details, but I only have a few minutes. And also, I'm the last thing between you and lunch, which is an unenviable position, by the way, but it does mean I'm gonna have to just kind of talk quickly about a few things and then maybe show you a couple of things too. So Core Connect is sitting here in between and um, and you might say, that sounds pretty good, Ben, but pretty dreamy, and people have been trying to do that for a long time, including me, with my team, and what are you doing differently, and how's that even possible? And like I said, I'm between you and lunch, and I won't get to show you everything, but I am gonna point out a couple of things. So first of all, um, there are two main uh, components inside Core Connect that let us achieve this magic gap closing. 
And one of them, does anybody want to take a guess? You all have been pretty shy this morning, and I'm kind of more of a Socratic methods person. Anybody want to guess what, what magic technique number one is? There might be a prize. Nobody? Come on, just yell it out. APIs, good, good guess, nope. Um, good one though, we got those too. Um, it, it would have been tough to guess this. Asynchrony. So I gotta let you in on a little secret. Tech nerds, we like to use fancy words. It's sort of a way of uh, compensating for our other social inadequacies. So we just use fancy words when we could have said some other simple thing that would have been much easier and everyone would understand. Um, but this is a term of art in, in computer science. This concept of asynchrony is at the key to CoreConnect's uh, technical design. And all this means is we're going to ask the computers to do the hard work ahead of time while the future humans who are going to log into that digital experience tonight or tomorrow or next month or next year, while they're off doing something more fun. I don't know what you were, did all of you, if, if you got in last night, I don't know if you went to bed early or if you hung out in Vegas for a while, um, but whatever you were doing, you probably weren't computing the answers that your policyholders or your agents need when they come to their digital experience today. Um, but that is how Core Connect, one of the tricks that Core Connect uses is it asks, it actually requires that these systems on the right, those systems of record, preload all the insurance data into Core Connect ahead of time. And so we do that out of band without bothering the humans who we care about and their precious time and their energy. We do it ahead of time because computing is cheap. So essentially we push all that data into Core Connect and buffer it. It's a little bit like a content delivery network for life insurance and annuity data. And I'm gonna have to gloss over it, but both business data as well as large objects like documents and assorted files are all buffered into the edge on Surefy's cloud platform in order to have those answers ready to answer to, to be responses to questions that people ask on that digital experience. So, would you like to see that? Okay, let's do it. Um, to do that, I have to introduce a new product because we didn't just invent Core Connect um, to serve uh, policyholders. We knew uh, quite a while ago that we wanted to build a dedicated experience for agents, advisors, and those in the intermediate channel. Um, and so I'm also excited, I guess the, the, uh, somebody stole my uh, thunder earlier, but we are also excited to announce this week our new product, Lifetime Agent which sits on top of this Core Connect engine. And Lifetime Agent, as, you, as you've probably surmised, is a digital experience, a portal for agents, advisors, and all the people who work around and support them. And I'm gonna show you an early peek at that now, I think. So, can you see my browser? Yeah. A little bit there. Um, so I am logged into Lifetime Agent. This is running in our cloud, running with our Core Connect, and I'm logged in as agent, uh, an agent named uh, Fili Philippa, Philippa, um, and she's uh, a pretty good agent. She, um, I, I wish I had time to show you all this, but lunch is also calling, and so I can't show you all the features in here. But if I just scroll down, you can kind of see she's logged in and she's got a dashboard that shows her a whole bunch of information. She's got open cases, maybe some alerts. She's got some aggregations over her book of business, maybe some financial roll-ups, maybe documents, marketing material, whatever is relevant to, to have on this dashboard. This is a real working system working against a real Core Connect instance, but Surefy is not a life insurer, so we don't have all of those red boxes. We're not running those. We simulate those in this demo. They are feeding simulated data into Core Connect. So you're seeing the real experience that you would get if you had fed the same data in from your systems. We're just not running those systems, but this is the real system. And so one thing that I'll point out um, is if I go into her book of business and go down to policies, um, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna make this a little bigger so you can see it. Um, you can see here kind of a table view of the policies that she has access to. Oops, better make it a little smaller. And the headline's kind of buried, but if you look way down here in the bottom, I don't know if I can zoom in. 
Um, in this, this particular agent, she's got a lot of policies, 13,337. Um, and and so, so maybe she has a large downline in this example. Um, I don't know, but we wanted to push the system a little bit to kind of show you what it's capable of. This, these policies are all uh, uh, active policies that she's got access to, or those that are lapsed or pending lapse. And I'll just click through these. I don't know if you can see, but essentially as fast as I can click, this portal is delivering that next view. Um, so she can move through these as fast as she would like. Uh, let's see if I can make this maneuver here. If she wants to sort by any particular thing, or even take columns and reorder them, or pick the ones that she wants to see, uh, she can add filters. Um, and then my favorite is this search box right here. If she goes up here and just starts typing, um, you know, Ben or what have you, oops, let me put it in order. Um, it'll just do a full text search across her whole book and give her answers essentially instantly or in about 500 milliseconds. Um, the whole time that this is happening, I didn't even click into the policies, but you know, even if, even if we move in and look at policy details, uh, you can kind of get the feel here. I mean, it's lightning fast, it's super fluid. And so what's happening here is that we, did, we made the computers do the hard work last night or a month ago. We pulled all that data into Core Connect and pre-computed the answers so that when she comes to the table and wants to log in and have this experience, we're not hitting any of those systems of record. Am I still alive? Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. We don't hit any of those red systems while she rips through those 13,000 policies. Only if something new happens is there a communication from those, and so they're staying unloaded. They're cool as cucumbers back there, just running day-to-day -day business. Meanwhile, Surefy system is taking all the load from those outside users, and by the way, giving them answers in milliseconds. In a lot of cases, we've even pre-optimized and shipped the entire book into RAM in the browser, so she doesn't even have to make queries back over to our network. Um, and that's how this system can be so fast. Um, fast is really good, fast is really important, but being able to access the entire book of business, the whole breadth from however many systems it's spread out over in your enterprise is one of the main features of Core Connect. Now the ways we build that plumbing and the way that data is brought together and transformed, that's a talk for another day, um, but I would invite you to come talk to us about that if you're interested in how that works. Um, but I think it's kind of, kind of cool. Um, so I wanted to show you that and that was my little demo. Uh, it's worth mentioning that we already make another digital experience for policy owners, for individual consumers. It's called Lifetime Service. Some of you are our customers, thank you very much. Um, now, starting today, Lifetime Service and Lifetime Agent are sibling DXPs, sibling digital experiences built on the same backing Core Connect engine. And I'll point that out only to mention that if you were to go and choose to work with us on implementing one of these experiences at your carrier, and you did all the work with us to connect it to Core, to connect your, your backend systems to Core Connect, well then you can leverage that investment in multiple DXPs. So there's only one Core Connect, but potentially multiple experiences, and those can be plugged and, plays, plugged and played as you like. Okay, so I said there were two magic things in Core Connect. The first is actually not that magic at all. It's just a, a really fancy, specialized, fit-for-purpose life insurance cash. Um, there's another piece of magic. Does anybody want to try to guess that and win a prize? No, you're done guessing. I badgered the first volunteer. Um, API would be a good guess, still not right. Um, the second piece of magic, the other core part of the architecture is a workflow orchestration engine. And um, that mechanism gives us and you a way to take every insurance process that you want to deliver out on the edge and encode it in one standard framework, in one standard powerful tool. We're actually using a tool made by a third party called Temporal you can look them up if you've never heard of them, T-E-M-P-O-R-A-L dot I-O. They are a billion dollar startup that you might not have heard of yet. Um, and they are a bunch of folks from Amazon and Uber and other places who worked at large enterprise 
and have been building this orchestration engine. This is not BPM. This is not the workflow from 2005. This is a very different kind of orchestration at a lower level. It's quite powerful. I don't have time to talk about it. I would love to do a whole talk just on Temporal and why we think it's great for life insurance. But we are using it as the backbone of our workflow engine. And so when we, uh, when we take an insurance process, we break it down into a set of steps and code, and we write those at Surefy in blue. And then when we take that and connect it at an insurance carrier, like we're doing with one of you who's sitting in this audience right now, who I'm not going to name because I don't want to embarrass them, but they are here and they would also be happy to talk to any of you, the rest of you, if you'd like to meet them, just come ask, we'll connect you. But we will take those blue pieces and then add on some special bits on the end to enable that workflow to talk to your systems. And so our workflow engine supports the transactions. I'm gonna draw the, I'm gonna move this picture around just a little bit and make room. And so if we take a particular transaction, let's say beneficiary change, and we encode it in this engine and drop it into Core Connect, well then, as users on the edge, on the digital experience, start interacting, we talk back and forth with that workflow as they move through the business process. And the computer keeps track of all of that in our cloud. Now, when you're ready, we then make, we take the steps at the edges of that flow and commit those transactions back to your backend systems. We can do that in milliseconds if those systems are ready to do it electronically today. But how many of you think you might have a core system that's not ready to receive a full digital transaction in real time? Does anybody have one of those? Anybody want to own up to it? Okay, there were a couple of people who raised their hands. Um, our experience has been that it's a range. There's a spectrum. Some systems for some lines of business, for some transactions, you might have an API ready to receive. In other cases, maybe not. Core Connect lets us control that and buffer it and manage it both in immediately and in, in time and strategic space over the course of many years together. Um, and so I wanna show you how that works as well. So I'm gonna go back to Lifetime Agent and I'm gonna try to do a second demo. And you might be wondering why, there we go, why I have this this beautiful piece of legacy technology up here. Um, it's also the riskiest part of this entire presentation because I have no idea if that thing is gonna work. But we're gonna try to make that thing work. Um, so we'll boot it up and I'm gonna go back into Lifetime Agent. I'm still in here as Agent Philippa and I'm just gonna, I don't know, just pick one of these term policies out of here. It doesn't really matter, whichever one. Here's Rose's policy and I'm gonna go in and uh, you probably noticed this big blue initiate button at the top right. This is our context sensitive action button that can dynamically adapt based on wherever the user is in the system and gives them all the things they want to do. And in this case, we've got a couple of different transactions loaded up. I'm going to do a change of beneficiary. Um, and so I'm going to click that and open it up. And behind the scenes, what has happened here is that Core Connect has received that request and has, has built an, a change beneficiary instance for Philippa for this policy for this change. And uh, I could have shown you a full straight through digital change. I could sit on my laptop and you could get an interview on the web and you could fill out the answers and that would be the normal way we would do change beneficiary if you wanted to fully digitize it. We do that all the time. But you've seen that kind of interface before and I thought I would show you something a little different with a little bit of a twist to give you a sense of the kind of things you can do when you have a platform that, let, that gives you a lot of options to, to do things in unique ways. And so in this particular case, humor me, at, for this carrier, at least for this line of business, this agent is going to receive a piece of paper. And we've generated it server side. Here's a change of beneficiary form. Can you, can you guys see it okay? Is it showing up? Yeah, it's up there. And, um, and I'll just note, we put it in red here, but you'll see that we already filled in the form as much as we could. So there's just an, a quick ease of doing business thing, right? Like, why would you ever just give an agent a form and then ask her or heaven forfend her customer to go fill that thing out when we already know all the things to put in the top of that form? So wherever we have context, because remember, she clicked initiate inside the policy, so we know who the policy owner is and therefore the client, well, we're gonna use that information to streamline the process. 
So we've got the form here. I'm going to click download, just like any other PDF. I'm going to download it to my browser. And you notice the, the workflow advanced already. It's now waiting for us to resend back the signed or completed form. I'm going to open it just here on my laptop. And here's the hard part. I'm going to try to print it. We'll see if it'll go. I think there's a chance. Oh, it's blinking. Um, so, uh, so does this seem weird? I mean, I'm up here. I'm a technology guy. We're at a, digi we're at a conference about tech, and I'm talking about digitization. And here I am showing you something with a dead tree and some pigment. Um, but the reality also, I think, is that paper or some proxy for paper is going to be with us for a long time to come. It's not going away the same way agents and advisors are not going away. There are just, we're just going to gradually move away from it. But there are a lot of times and places still today in life insurance where there are times when you do need a piece of paper. And I could rattle off all the reasons from regulatory to compliance to, frankly, that's just the way that particular advisor does business with her customers. And what will be it for us to tell them how, how they have to change? So here's a piece of paper. I printed it out. It's not in red anymore, but all the data is filled in that's relevant. And I'll just tell you this is a special piece of paper. It's not just a piece of paper. It's not just one with the stuff filled in. Did you see this code up here? We're getting used to these. You know what this is? This is an inextricable direct link back to the transaction that's running in Core Connect that's following this transaction and therefore this piece of paper. And so the computer at Surify knows that Philippa is, is trying to get this process completed and has moved to paper to do it. And so I'm going to do it. I brought a big red pen. And I'm just going to sign, probably put myself as a beneficiary. And uh, I'm going to switch devices. Or I'm going to try anyway. We'll see if it works. Um, let me share it so you can see my phone on the screen. OK, so now you can see my phone. Don't make fun of it. I have weird apps. Um, but I, I'm, still, I'm still pretending to be Philippa. I'm going to open my camera. And now I'm in the field. Can you guys see, you see that? Oh, yeah, there you go. Say hi. Wave to all the remote attendees. How many do we have, by the way? Do we know? 12? Thanks, Dustin. Um, all right, so I'm going to grab this QR code. And I'm going to launch in. Now, Philippa is already authenticated on Lifetime Agent on her phone. Oh, no, she's not. She's getting ready to log back in. Let me try that again. It's all these logins and timeouts, it's, it's so annoying. There we go. OK. Now I'll take the picture. So now, via that code, I've come back into the exact same spot in the transaction just in a mobile view. It's kind of skinny up there, sorry, hard to read. But it is a mobile responsive experience. All of the Surefy experiences are. And so now you can see it knows that I'm on that same second step. And I've moved the transaction over to this device. But behind the scenes, it's being managed in that cloud instance of Core Connect. And so I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to scan it with my camera. I'll do a slipshod job of that. And then I can just select to use that photo. That's going to get pushed up to the cloud. And you'll see in just a moment, now it's showing me that image. You know, I can zoom in and make sure it's what I want, or I can do this on the desktop. Um, and then I can hit Submit. And if I had had my Wi-Fi working and had been signed in, I could have done that demo in 12 seconds instead of 70. But it was pretty straightforward, right? We went from desktop to paper back to mobile. And now, if I were to jump back to my desktop and come back in here and just refresh this page, um, as you might expect, this transaction is going to rehydrate with all the data once the internet catches up. It's a little dicey in this room. There you go. And you can see it's now caught up in here as well if for some reason she came back in and wanted to watch it over here. Um, you can also back up, by the way, and see all the previous steps. That's all supported. But in this case, I just did a straight through. So this is a little fictitious, sort of simulated workflow. But hopefully, it gives you a feel for some of the things you can do with Lifetime Agent and with Core Connect. You can move around at will. And you can engineer process over the top of all those systems. Um, and so I think that's pretty exciting. Couple more slides. Um, I just want to point one thing out about that workflow engine and what you saw. Something really important to the design and something to think about um, whether you decide to do something 
with us one day or build something like this yourself. Um, one of the key things about Core Connect is that when you're working with these workflows, there is a really nice boundary here between the retail or digital edge experience and those core systems. And that boundary creates a happy separation. It's like a good fence that makes good neighbors. It allows the experience out there on the edge not to be dictated or constrained by the system of record limitations behind the scenes. I'll be honest with you, advisors, they don't care about the system mess behind the scenes at any carrier. And consumers don't even understand that there's a mess for the most part. They just want to get online and do their stuff and get on with their life. And, whoa, I'm out of there. Uh, that was cool. Um, and so one of the things Core Connect does a really good job of is it buffers away the edge and the experience from the systems. If the systems aren't ready to take it electronically, no problem. You can still roll it out on your DXP and then we'll send it manually. Or it can be put in a queue for processing. Or you can use an RPA to ins insert it into your CICS mainframe application. Whatever you need to do, you've got a lot of options. Not just straight through and not just synchronously tied. And that separation of concern is at the heart of the technical design, and it's one of the ways that it unlocks the option to move forward quickly and efficiently in time and space with this problem. Hope that makes sense. Um, we have just a couple of minutes left, and I wanna take a couple of questions. So I've tried to prime you by inducing you to do things. I have one autographed piece of paper with a CTO signature on it as a prize for the best question. Does anybody have a question? Let's see if there are any from the live audience first. We have Mike Runners. Does anybody have a question? Okay, we got several over here. We'll run them, oh, one over here, okay. Take one wherever. Yeah, go for it, Chris, thank you. Uh, during that paper process, is there a reason you wouldn't also offer that as a digital e-signature? Absolutely. In fact, there's a whole bunch of hybrid options on the spectrum from raw paper to pure digital, right? One thing that I didn't show is that that form that we pre-fill part of is still fillable. So maybe that's one step you would take is just fill the rest out on your computer. I kind of did it on paper to, for, for theater, but you could totally do that. The next step up from that, of course, would then just to be do e-signature, which is very commonplace. But there are still times and places where e-signature is either not acceptable or not viable or just not desired. So yeah, you have the full range at your disposal. And of course, obviously, the, the creme de la creme is just straight through digital. Maybe you generate a form on the back end for regulatory reasons, but then you know the signature is almost you know, is, is, is not even, that is kind of a second show. Um, so you have the full range there. Um, this was just trying to show one of those edges. It's a great question. You don't win the autograph though. It was, it was a good one though. Another question? Yeah. Hi, how do you deal with the business rules? Good question. Yeah, what, what happens with business rules? That could be another 40 minute talk. So we probably should chat at lunch. Um, there are a lot of places where rules and logic have to be embedded in that chain. And I didn't show where those are, but one of the big focuses in Core Connect is on creating well-defined places where those rules can exist safely and be managed over a long time. Because you see, we're building lifetime agent service in Core Connect to be a generational system. Not just a website you slap together and turn on digital this year, but actually something that can be treated as important and sacrosanct to your business as those core systems that we all know and mostly love. Um, we think there's room to do that there, and the only way to do that in the long run sustainably is to create good boundaries. And so down on the, on the bottom feed where data comes through into that asynchronous model, there's a pluggable place for the logic that combines and coheres that information. And similarly, at the workflow level, you can drop logic into those workflow steps to control and compose the experience and to apply carrier or product or distribution or channel specific business logic. So um, obviously, you know, we've been working on this a year, we'll be working on this for many more years, and you'll probably see us embolden that and get more detailed about how that works in the, next, in the quarters and years to come. But built in at the lowest level is the notion that we can keep those things separate and carefully managed and then upgraded over time. This is another good question. One more, okay. I'm at the, I'm at the buzz, I'm gonna get the, the hook. But this um, is the how are you dealing with uh, unstructured notes or data that are stored in these core systems that associate the policy that they would need to reference on the UI that you had up? Great question, unstructured data, manuscript endorsements, 
all those kinds of things. They're pretty similar to large objects like PDFs and paper scans. You know, we don't have computation to directly tell us what those are. So we have to bring those in, instrument them with metadata, and then potentially make them available to the user in a controlled scenario. I think it's a really, it's kind of case by case. The system can facilitate those, but if we don't have metadata, we can't compute over it. And so the best we can do at that point is show it. Um, so we have to be gentle with that stuff. But if you've got a lot of it, and you probably do in some parts of, this, of the world, um, you, you'll want some facilitation for that because a lot of the information's in, trapped inside that unstructured information. I don't have a way around the laws of physics there, nothing magic there, unfortunately. Um, could be, sounds like a whole other uh, company could be made to do just that. But, um, but yeah, we have a facility to support the, the, moving that data around. And so that's a great question. I know you have a lot more questions. Um, I would just implore you, come find us. We'll be at lunch, at breaks. Um, we're going to be here all week. Um, please just come see us and talk to us. Uh, ask us questions, throw rocks at the design. Uh, we would really love to have you. I know lunch is coming. Thank you so much. Have a great lunch, a great ITC. Thank you again. Sayonara.